the home of jump racing. This is where the magic happens. Feel like a Cheltenham favourite with Paddy Power. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Road to Cheltenham. Ruby, how are you? I am wonderful, Lydia. How are you? I'm very well indeed. We have got a lot to get through this week, though, so should we just kick on? I think we should. It was a crack and weekend's race, and so, hey, let's go. It really was. Well, let's start by talking about Honeysuckle, shall we? She came back in the Hatton's Grace hurdle. She's now unbeaten in 13 starts. The last eight races are in grade ones, and all bar one of those are were in open company. Um, and this is the start of her season, Ruby. Yeah, and look, Henry had made no secret about the fact that he'd have her a bit fitter than he had her last year. And did we see anything different or learn anything new? No, but we got to see Honeysuckle. Um, and what was different, all right, she started lined up in the same place as she usually does. Only Patrick Mullins went outsider on Saldier. Normally, Honeysuckle is the widest on the track, and she jumped the first very well. Now, the second hurdle, Stormy Island missed it in front, and Honeysuckle, which as par for the course with her, was a bit deliberate jumping the second. But when they got to the fourth hurdle, which was the last with a circuit to race, Stormy Island has gone clear of Ronald Pump and Honeysuckle. But already you can see the, the effect the pace is having on those behind. Saldier, Patrick Mullins is starting to squeeze and niggle. He was flat to the boards. And Abracadabra, as you turn away from the stands and climb up towards Ballyhack, he's also going pretty much as fast as he wants to be going. Now, when they run back down to the fifth last, Honeysuckle flies it up behind Ronald Pump, but both Saldier and Abracadabra, when the pressure's on and they're starting to chase, both missed the fifth last. And what was interesting, as they turned to four out, which is past the six for the marker, Rachel Blackmore moves up on the outside of Stormy Island. She was committing really early. She had no fear about fitness or stamina. Ronald Pump goes with her, but that never allows the ones behind to even get into the race. And by the time they get down to the second last hurdle, it's all over. She jumps the second last really well, but again, as Honeysuckle does down to the last hurdle, shimmies off to her left, a slow jump, but she was just just much too good for the opposition. Yeah, she remains totally dominant in this division at the moment, doesn't she? Um, that jumping that you mentioned during the course of last season up to the sort of peak of the champion hurdle, it got a little bit slicker, didn't it? it, was it do you expect the same to happen, i.e. first time out, slight restiness, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. Actually, and the more I went back looking at it before we were on last week, I think our best round of jumping was actually in Leperstown. Mm -hmm. um, she was good in the champion hurdle, but she was brilliant at Leperstown. She was good at Cheltenham and she was a little bit worse at Punchestown. But um, no, she's she, if anything, she's safe and she takes the extra half a stride. But um, yeah, it, it will get better. But look, what's going to beat her? But you look back at the race, Lydia, and you're thinking, how are Saldier, Abacadabra, those horses struggling so early in the race? Well, it's a common theme of the Hatton's race hurdle. And I think if you go back and look at the previous winners, like an Apple Shade, Solarina, Limestone Lad, they did the same thing, to, same things to horses. Um, and, and I don't know, it's because Hunt Ferry House even is very level or slightly downhill from the two and a half mile start till you get past the stands that the pace never relents early in a Hatton's race when you've got real stars like Honeysuckle. Yeah, she became the fourth three-time winner of that race, and you've mentioned the other ones, Limestone Lad, Solarina, Apples Jade. Let's think about Apples Jade, uh, how she managed to, to win her Hatton's Grace. Which, ones, which, which one have you chosen, the 2018 one? Yeah, and I think it was where Patrick Mullins went on Wicklow Brave and kind of thought, yeah, we, he'll serve it up to Apples Jade and we'll see what happens. Uh, and we knew what happened. Wicklow Brave went with Apples Jade to the first. Um, I'm on Limonene, the chestnut and the pink colours. Super Sunday's in there as well. But by the time we get to the winning post, um, away from the fifth hurdle, you can already see how strung out they are and Apple Shade is running away. Now down to the fifth last, the one that Salier and Abacadabra missed, Limini missed it as well. That's just the pressure on in the middle of the race and you're starting to feel a pinch. And again, if you watch Jack Kennedy heading to the fourth last, passing the sick pole, the very same as Rachel Blackmore, he moves up on Apple Shade. It's just a sign of how easy they're going compared to the opposition. And when you spin it on to the second last, look, it's quite like watching Honeysuckle in a way. She's just well clear and the race is over. The one difference is Apple Shade absolutely flies the last compared to Honeysuckle. But great horses do that in grade one company. They're just able to keep the pressure on the opposition all the way. 
yeah, she ended up beating Super Sunday by 20 lengths. It was among her better performances of her career, probably her very best, the Irish champion hurdle in 2019. She, it's a similar kind of level of form that you think at Honeysuckle and Apple Shade, or do you not really think of things like that? I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to equate. I mean, if you look back at Solarina in 2004, she beat Brave Inca and Rule Supreme. If you go to Limestone Lad in 99, he beat oh. Istanbul. Oh, you know what I mean? uh, but limestone lad i mean come on let, let, let's let's talk about limestone lad beating Easterberg. i mean limestone lad was brilliant he was spectacular and that to me and people love to do it but how do you equate them you're never going to get them all in the same race and <laughs> or you can say well the ratings were who cares um to me they're they're champions in their own era in their own right and that's all any athlete can be and that's what horses are they are athletes so this is Limestone Lad over two and a half miles, which would be at the bottom end of his most, most brilliant range, uh, up against Isterbrack, who of course was brilliant at two miles. Yeah, look, they met in the, in the, in the at the middle distance, but um, yeah, and it was a race for the ages. But I also still don't think it's fair to try and say, well, would Honeysuckle have won that, or would any power of Fahin or Hurricane Fly, or it's not. They're just, it's a great conversation, but there's never an answer to it. That's what we try to do there. It's great. It's great having the chat and it, it's part of the enjoyment of racing. Right. OK, so there is Honeysuckle and she's uh, at the top of the pile. Let's have a look at some of the horses that she'll be facing from Britain, because some of the key ones were in action this weekend as well. The day before the Hatton's Grace, we had the fighting fifth at Newcastle. It was a race that Epitant won outright at the start of last season when everything seemed to go fine. Her seasons plateaued or rather went a little downhill with back problems last season this time around she was making a comeback following back surgery and she ended up dead heating with not so sleepy yeah and it was a, it was a, a pretty easy race or looked like an easy race on paper to figure out what would happen you literally had two divisions you had void or ev um silver streak and not so sleepy forward and soraya lepitant and mom morale following them but i i don't know i, I thought i was running a pretty strong gallop and mom morale I don't think we saw, I know he pulled up injured after and that probably explains it, but he was the first horse to really feel the pressure, even if Voidarev was the first one to be beaten. But um, what did I really think? I thought it was a good race to watch. It was entertaining, but I didn't see anything that's going to trouble Honeysuckle. No. OK, well, let's go through them briefly individually. Uh, Nikki Henderson, the trainer of Epitant, is of the view that she will come on quite a bit for that performance fitness wise I would imagine also maybe confidence wise because her hurdling was better than towards the end of last season when something was hurting yeah definitely and if you think not so sleepy was fit from racing on the flat so Royale had the two runs at Kempton Park and Wincanton so yeah she theoretically realistically factually should have been the unfittest so she's the one likeliest to improve to improve but that only puts her back in the same position where she was at the end of last season yeah I, 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 I not agree so and so Royale yeah, I, I, I agree with that, I'm afraid. Um, but um, Aidan Coleman was saying that he was thinking about, he'd got so royal on the inside and he came sort of back and round, not so sleepy. How much impact do you think that had on the result? Well, to be fair to Aidan Coleman, there isn't a jockey riding that shouldn't think when you're dead, he to get beat, I should have done something differently. As I watched the race, I didn't quite see it. I thought Aidan was quite harsh on himself, actually. Um, I thought he delivered Epitant with her best chance. I thought by boxing Sorayal in, he forced Daryl Jacob to commit on Sorayal, who's not the most resolute. Um, and then he came out not so sleepy, not so or and Epitant and Sorayal got a better jump at the last than not so sleepy, even though the three of them were quite good. And Epitant to me actually robbed the dead heat. And um, as I watched it live, I thought not so sleepy was the one that had won, and it was only by the pure nod that kept Epitant in it. So I thought Aiden was harsh enough on himself. Um, and no, I, I just, I was a little disappointed. I thought when she flew the last fitness or no fitness, she'd beat the other two. Jonathan Burke said afterwards that that's the way that he wants to ride not so sleepy in a sort of positive, assertive manner. He felt that tracking the lead in the champion hurdle didn't see that horse at his best. And for the rest of the season over the top two mile races, he'll be riding not so sleepy assertively. What do you think? I'd say Rachel Blackmore was absolutely chuffed when she read that. <laughs> Something's going to give me a lead and go a gallop. Happy days. Do you think that is better for that horse himself, though? It probably is, um, and he's an admirable horse, um, but he needs a lot of luck to win a champion hurdle. 
We'll come back to him in a moment because our roadies, our viewers, have had some other thoughts about him. Are you did you just call So Royal irresolute? Yeah, I don't think he's the greatest battler in the world. Uh, he's a lovely horse. He's a strong traveller, but I definitely think when it gets how many battles has he won, Lydia? But you don't think it's grade related? No, I think I think if he's and if he couldn't, like in fairness to Daryl Jacob, how did how did deliver him any later the way that race transpired? But I think he wants to be the last one attacking, um, or else he wants to get completely on top if he's going to win. Silver Streak, holding his head uncomfortably, I felt, and making a load of mistakes. What did you make of him? He was on the front end in bad weather. It could be as simple as that for him. Um, mm. Or maybe there's a bit more to it. But um, no, I look, Silver Streak, when he's having a real going day, he's a really good horse. But he has had a couple of in and out runs as well in his life. OK, he's won um, the Christmas hurdle, of course, uh, at last yeah. season. And you mentioned the top juvenile, Mon Miral. He did return with a nasty cut, which apparently he got when another runner jumped into him. But Pornicles has also said it's back to the drawing board. That says to me that he doesn't think that was enough to account for Monmiral's performance on his first try in open company. No, but how often do we say it? Juvenile struggle in the second season and he was a strong stay in juvenile. Um, he stayed really well one day to win at Exeter. He probably just wants further anyway. He reminds me of Clan de Zobo. I think we're going to see the best of him once he goes over the fences next season and beyond that. Um, let's reflect on, you mentioned, if Epitant does come on for the for the fighting fifth, that leaves us basically in the same position as the, in the 2021 champion hurdle. And we can have a look at the relative positions of Honeysuckle, the winner, of course, Epitant who finished third, possibly arguably could have finished a little bit closer in third still if she hadn't have got boxed in a round of two out and then not so sleepy who gets outpaced and then just sticks on for fifth. Yeah, but Epitone finishes three and a half lengths in front of not so sleepy. There's a length and a quarter to Silver Streak and another three parts of a length back to Salier. And I think that form and finishing position is pretty reflective of those horses' abilities and where they would all finish when they meet in good form. I tend to agree with that. Let's think about the rest of the season. Um, in Ireland, we've got the Matheson Hurdle over Christmas. We've got the Christmas Hurdle. Uh, beyond that, in February, obviously, there's the Irish Champion Hurdle, there's the Champion Hurdle, and then we've got Aintree and Punchestown beyond that. In terms of the Matheson, do you think there's any chance that we could see Honeysuckle there? No, I'd say Henry will stick to this very same tried and tested route that he's gone with her last year. She'll go straight to the Dublin Racing Festival. Um, and I suppose that makes Charger probably the one to beat in the Matheson Hurdle. Yeah, OK. Right, I mentioned that you roadies have got some different ideas about not so steep. You've been getting in touch to say so. Now, Ruby, I'm going to hold back what your view on these are until later on in the show. But this is just three thoughts from Rick, from our viewers. So Ricky Hogan, he says, um, I think his work is placed in the champion hurdle. Johnny Burke's key to the horse. I'd definitely go if there was a lack of pace in the race, as he could get a soft lead he likes to dictate. The golf club at the golf club says... No, point and shoot in the champion hurdle. Don't try and restrain him like last year. Let him do his own thing. And Chris Jones says he wants to know, and you can maybe answer this question, Ruby. Do you upgrade Not So Sleepy's run given that So Royal ran his race and has beaten a leading champion hurdle contender? Or do you downgrade Epitance for not putting the race to bed? More hurdles for Not So Sleepy means more dodgy jumping. Yeah, he is a bit wayward for a horse with a lot of, or a lot of experience. Uh, the way he runs around a little bit on takeoff side, but um, the downgrade, upgrade, I don't know. Um, I think the one that was there's lots of positives to take out of Epitant, but you'd still like to see her have win in the race, so you're probably bringing her down a bit rather than putting the others up. Okay, so those are our thoughts on the two milers after the fabulous return of Honeysuckle. There'll be more about Not So Sleepy later on the show, but next we're moving on to the novice hurdlers. <laughs> And now to talk about the novice hurdlers. And Ruby, in order to kick this off, we asked the roadies, which novice hurdler excites you most right now? Now, you remember a couple of weeks ago, I demanded that we would get 2,000, more than 2,000 responses. And last week was really disappointing. I was bitterly disappointed. It took me several days to get over it. How many replies do you think we've had this time around? I'd say none. I said there's no one that have read you. <laughs> more than 2,000 people, Ruby. Oh, there's lots of people have read you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, back up your ideas. Right. Well done, guys. Congratulations. That was that's the kind of response we like to see. Can we make it 3,000? Can we? Anyway, overwhelmingly, Ruby, they voted for John Bomb. 
What did you think of Newbury Novice Hurdle winner John Bond? I don't find that surprising, Lydia. Um, and I thought he was really good. Obviously, it was a messy start, and it's usually something we say about Ireland, but this is a really impressive maiden hurdle performance, which we don't hear about too much in the UK. But look, I it was it, no one wanted to go on. It was a story run race earlier, early, and John Bond eventually took over going to the third hurdle, which he jumped really well, jumped his way to the front. I thought he was really good then at the fourth. I thought he was nimble and quick with his feet at the fifth. They rounded into the straight to the third last, which was the sixth hurdle, and he came out of Aidan Coleman's hands. Great scope, but he was always in control of this race, and he never looked in, in any way in danger. Good risk at all was a fair horse, and, and he's made him look a lot less superior to him. So, um, yeah, I was really taken with John Bond. Loved everything he did. Yeah, jumped far better than the runner-up, didn't he? Uh, this is what the roadies think. So David Harvey says, John Bond's the most exciting. Thought he was very slick at his hurdles, particularly for a debut but he does point out that if you ran this poll next week, there could be a number of other horses challenging for the title because there's some big names entered over the coming week. More of that in a moment. David Goodall says, not John Bond. He seemed close to boiling over prior to the start at Newbury. Although travelling smoothly on the bridle, I'm not convinced he'll handle a full house, uh, the raw prior to the supreme start. And what would he find off the bridle? I think he'd find plenty. Um, and look, Classical Dream was a, was one I was I can think of that was quite messy that managed to go and win a messy in the prelims that managed to go and win a Supreme. But I think John Bond will improve with age. Um, he was quite worked up at the Newbury work gallops morning. I watched him going to post on Saturday, Friday even at Newbury. And I loved the way he went down. So professional, ears pricked, no ducking, no diving. Um, I think he's a professional racehorse that just has a bit of bounce to him more so than anything. Yeah, I agree. Um, Nicky Henderson has called him a bit of a fidget. I think he's growing up in front of our eyes and he's a full brother to Duval and I think he's got that bit of pep about him that good horses tend to have. Good word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Statuaire, of course, lost out in the vote, but she did a win a grade one on Sunday. So I suppose swings and roundabouts. Yeah, swings and roundabouts is right. Uh, the Royal Bond it was an interesting race. Obviously, Arctic Warrior and my mate Mozzie said about making the running. Um, and they went a good gallop down to the first, but they slowed it down because from the second hurdle to the winning post, if you see in the red and white colours, Mighty Potter, Brian Cooper, he was quite keen. When the round event to the third hurdle, my, my, Mozzie, my mate Mozzie jumps on, but look for statue wearing the orange. She's now racing quite keenly. So this race wasn't run at a, at a strong tempo. When they passed the sixth furlong marker, heading to the fourth last hurdle, look for the black colours impervious. Brian Hayes moves out to be ready to attack. But because he moved out so early, this race started to build earlier probably than it should have and as they get to the second last hurdle my mate Mozzie flies it in front statuaire and the orange is tucked in mighty potter and the red makes a mistake but it's the last hurdle that's key here my Mozzie get my mate Mozzie gets in too deep makes a mistake and it allows statuaire to pounce but the one that caught my eye as they run by the winning post and around the bend is mighty potter the race definitely didn't suit him and he was the one that was finishing the best Yep, some riders have picked out Mighty Potter from that race as well. They've also, there's quite a bit of love for my mate Mozzie. What would you say about that? He was just unlucky. He'd been really professional in his first two starts. But I think like John Bond in the UK, there's bigger ones and better ones. I want to start rolling out every week. Willie Mullins was interesting about Statuaire. He said afterwards that he ran her here rather than the handicap because if there was ever going to be a grade one that she could win, this was her chance with all of her experience. Mare's novice hurdle is the target for her this season at Cheltenham? Oh. I would have thought so. I thought Impervious was setting the standard until the weekend. She was maybe a little disappointed in the Royal Bond. Statuaire beat her. And then, of course, she had Grangy as well, winning a maiden hurdle on Saturday. So a couple coming in there. I'm glad you mentioned her because she's been raised by some of our roadies under C Other, uh, the market man, who's a regular correspondent. Nice to hear from you again. Um, he said it's the most confident novice bet that right now would be for Grangy in the mare's novice. She has gears, she stays and jumps like a stag. What did you make of her at Fairy House? I thought she jumped really well, Lydia. Um, she was a decent mare last year, beat Party Central at the Dublin Racing Festival, came back and won the, the mare's bumper at Punchestown. So she's a decent mare who jumped really well. Um and who's setting the standard mares wise in Ireland at the moment, do you think? I thought it was impervious until the weekend, having watched her in Down Royal. And she's probably dropped slightly down the pecking order with Statue Air beating her. Grangy looks the potential. And obviously it's LA Bell in the UK, probably. Absolutely. After her win at Newbury, where she hurdled a lot better and looked to benefit from a stronger pace as well. Um, and will stay going up in trip. Uh, how about Stage Star, another winner from Newbury? There's some love for this one. Ad Arnold says, travels well, jumps well and has a turn of foot. And Barbella says, um, 
going the same route as Brave Man's Game, which is referring to the fact that connections are talking about going to the Chalo potentially next. Yeah, possibly. Uh, made all made a mistake at the second, but other than that, he was never really troubled. I'd like to see him again before I'd form a strong opinion. I didn't think it was the deepest race. So remember the question, which was, which novice hurdler excites you most right now? We've had loads of people replying, Sir Gerhard and Kilcrut, first and second in the champion bumper at the Cheltenham Festival, but not to my knowledge, having jumped a hurdle in public so far. Well, they're obviously exciting people on potential um, more than anything else. And look, Kilcrut holds an entry at the weekend. I think Sir Gerhard as well. Um, they're both in good form. But yeah, look, you're, you're back here. And seeing them or getting excited about them and potential, not in what you've seen them do over hurdles thus far. Here is the excitement. Luke Sharples cannot wait to see him ping a hurdle. Uh, Lockers says uh, he's in the Kilcrut camp. Yes, John Bond was impressive, but overall, what did he beat? Can't wait to see the Irish horses run and think they'll come to Cheltenham and be dominating again. And Paddy at Jelly Thought says, uh, surely Kilcrut has to be top of the list. If he comes out and shows he can jump a hurdle, he'll wipe the floor with John Bond, who hasn't beaten anything of note yet. If being the word. And also, I mean, their first time out, they might not beat anything of note. Of course, you could have a scenario, Bob and Joe jumping into third hollow, but quite often, yeah, you'll be a very, very good horse beating a lot of lesser horses. Yeah, you will in a maiden hurdle. It's not until they get into novices then by Christmas or early in the new year that you see uh, where the pecking order is. But um, yeah, look, they're all in good form, but they have to go and do it on the track. So for Luke, Lockers and Paddy at Jelly Thought, it is very much in Willie we trust which is not something you want to say outside of racing company. Now, we asked you what you thought you should do with Not So Sleepy. Um, this is the staying hurdles section, so it gives you a clue as to what Ruby might be thinking. Ruby, you're looking at the 2020 Cesarevich with Not So Sleepy tanking along late on, and you're thinking... I'm thinking up in trip. Um... Be it the stairs hurdle or the two and a half in entry, I think he needs to go up and trip. And to me, watch him in Newcastle, the way he rallied back, I'm not certain he has the gears for two miles over hurdles. I know he's dead heated in the fight in fifth, but um, when you strip the rest of them fitter and up the quality of the opposition, I think he needs to change the distance. Now, this is something that you thought last week about Goshen. Shall we remind ourselves what you said then? Here's another one for you then, Goshen. Now, Goshen absolutely thumped song for someone when he made his glorious return in the Kingwell last season. We saw what happened in the Champion Hill, just unable to handle the tight left-handed track of the old course. What did you make of his run at Ascot? I thought it was good. I'd ride him the same way and then run him in the long walk as well. So naturally, I put it to Gary Moore what he thought. And Gary said, might you toy with going up in trip with him? No. It's a straight answer to a yeah, straight question. Yeah. No, everybody keeps telling me that's three miles now. It's not a boat. Yeah, you know, like, he, 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 he's got stacks of speed, but anyway. he's come out of the race tremendously well, which says to me that he probably saved a little bit for himself that day, you know? Well, Gary knows Goshen best, but doctors differ, patients die. <laughs> that, that's the second time this week that I have heard that phrase. I'd never, ever heard it before this week. It's all about opinions, Lydia, even for doctors. And not everybody, and nobody gets it right all the time. <laughs> Sadly, no. Right, OK, let, I said it was the staying hurdle section. So let's talk about the long distance hurdle that was staged at Newbury last Friday. Um, this was quite an extraordinary little race. Talk us through this, Ruby. I'm going to enjoy this. Yeah, it was an extraordinary race. And look, obviously nobody wanted to line up. We didn't, we kind of expected that. And then uh, Paisley Park jinked right. And obviously indefatigable, well, she didn't look like she wanted to go anywhere and that's the way she ran as well but uh, Paisley Park went with on the blind side to the first and by the time we got to the second it was a new position for Paisley Park he was clearly in front cheap pieces on and he was he was he was liking it and that's the way the race went for a long way till he got down the back straight to the fourth last and the pay, fifth last even the pace is starting up over the fifth last fourth last as well and they really are turning the pressure on round the bend into the home straight and Thomas Darby who's eventually going to win Looks well and truly held when they face up to the third last. Now Paisley Park goes to three out and he stands a long way off it. He gets there, but ultimately when he lands, it's Aidan Coleman's reaction. He goes from being on the bridle before he jumps it to all of a sudden he's flat out and Aidan Coleman is gone for his whip and working really hard. And then all of a sudden your eye is drawn to the one behind, which is Thomas Darby. 
but by the time they get to the second last, it looks like he's going to be in front too soon. And Sean Bone, his body language just slows down, jumps to second last, switches outside Paisley Park on the blind side, keeps plugging away, and Thomas Darby goes about his business and wins. I don't know. I didn't do the time analysis on it, but it looked to me like a race that fell apart from halfway between the third last and second last to the line, and Thomas Darby has gone and won. Um, what did I make of it? I don't know. I just think Paisley Park is regressing. That's all I took from it. Yes. Okay. So Emma Lavelle is of the view that they'll go to the long walk, which was his best performance of last season. He won a grade one, you know, even not mm. at his best last season. Uh, and he's still achieving a, a high level of form that many people would envy, but they're going to go back to the long walk. They're going to ride him in the traditional way. So more patiently. And she hasn't decided on the cheek pieces. Your thoughts. I, my thought on last year's long walk was always Richard Johnson's reaction when he crossed the line on time hill. He felt his horse pulled up and stopped and when you watch it back how much later could Richard have the ladies challenge not any but time who got left in front and slowed down and Paisley Park I always felt robbed it now he robbed it he won it fair play but I think he has regressed and I was a massive Paisley Park fan but I just think he's on the way down I think he did well to get there personally at Ascot as well I think you can say some positive things about Paisley Park from that performance from last season as well how about Thomas Darby first time tongue tie his head carriage not quite so jaunty and now they're thinking long walk stay as hurdle for him yeah it looks a natural progression and obviously the tongue tie worked because if his head's coming down that means he's not struggling to get air but he made a terrible mistake and really that should put you out of a top class race and just because of the way the race was won he's ended up in front when the music stopped basically that's a good reflection of the Newbury race um indefatigable didn't really want to start didn't want to go, um, never looked comfortable and was well beaten from a long way out. Lost a lot of ground at the start. Though. Mrs Milner, non-stayer at this grade? Looked it, looked it. Um, maybe she wants slower ground, I don't know. Looked it. Uh, it was a big step up for her, she just didn't make it. But look, I suppose you have to give every horse a second chance. Shocker from listener to Oscar. Yeah. What's been his best run for a while? I can't think off the top of my head, but... I don't think he's ever fulfilled or got back to the heights that he, he was at when he won the stairs hurdle. I suspect it probably would have been the stairs hurdle when he was in a really good position, travelling strongly when he came down last season, but it was a long way out, so I can't prove it. Let's move on to the Hatton's Grace, shall we? Or back to the Hatton's Grace, because you mentioned Ronald Pump finishing second to Honeysuckle again. Abacadabras was third. Afterwards, it was not surprising to hear that Ronald Pump has the stairs as a target, might come to the long walk at, at Ascot. But Gordon Elliott has said uh, the stairs hurdle for Abacadabras as well. Yeah, look, Ronald Pump obviously jumped out and went with the front runners. And when they wait, raced away from the stands in the first time headgear, he was comfortable going with Honeysuckle and they were chasing uh, Stormy Island. Abacadabra, for a horse that always looked like a really strong traveller, he didn't really look that happy through the rest. And when you look at, back at it, Lydia, his best run last year was arguably beating Buzz at entry for Abacadabra. That was going up in trip. Abacadabra could be a strong travelling horse and people say, oh, he's a bit soft, he doesn't want to be in front. Perhaps he just wants a trip. It could be as simple as that. And maybe going out in distance would bring about the improvement in him. Ronald Pump, he is an admirable horse, but checkered enough career soundness-wise, didn't have many stars last season. Yeah, uh, missed Christmas with a problem, missed the stairs hurdle with a problem, but had finished at second the stairs the previous season. Let's have a look at the long walk entries because they are intrig intriguing. Ronald Pump is there, but my eye was drawn to um, three in particular, I think. Time Hill, your favourite, Ruby. Um, Sporting John, interesting that Philip Hobbs has entered the Cheltenham staying hurdle winner at grade one level. Um, stable mate of Time Hill, of course. And Champ, who misses this weekend's many clouds. Yeah, I suppose, look, the way Champ's jump and fell apart at the back end of last season, it's not surprising to see him, him in there. Sporting John, it looked like a natural progression from Cheltenham for him. And Time Hill, well, he had a disappointing run in France. But I, I just think, and looking back through different horses I rode in France, going there without a run to win a big race in Autoy in, in November is a hard thing to do. I can have a look at the betting, um, looking ahead for the rest of the season. Do you think this is a signal that we're going to be see Champ with his back operation campaigned over hurdles this season? It's obviously plan B, isn't it? In that 
initially at the start of the season they were talking bet fair chase he did, did, wasn't able to get there many clouds chase wasn't able to get there and now we've got this herding option is that a signal do you think i don't know but that's part of being a trainer you have to try and figure out what's best for your horse and if he's going back to hurdles that's obviously what they think is the best thing to do with him so those are our thoughts then on the staying hurdlers next up it's analyze this So this week on Analyze This, we're going to analyze starts. Race are never won at the start, but they can be lost. And we saw that in Newbury last Saturday on a couple of occasions. We'll start with the Jerry Fielding. One more for the road and Jack Quinlan. Nobody wanted to make the running. But the key to getting what's perceived to be a soft lead is being able to go fast enough to keep the jockeys behind you happy, yet slow enough that you're dictating the race. And that's what Jack Quinlan does. Gow Road is quite keen under Sam Twist and Davis, but Jack just about goes fast enough that Sam is happy to follow him yet he's still going slow enough to be in pole position. It didn't win the race, but it was the winning of the race. That was actually plan B, Jack Quinlan and Neil King revealed afterwards. They were going to take a lead, but nobody else wanted to do that. And for Soaring Glory and Gal Road in particular, I think that small field race was always not going to play to their favour. No, but you should always have a plan B, a C, a D and an E as a jockey. Right, so then you're going to move on to the Labrooks Trophy and differ the differing aspects of this start. Yeah, completely different. Obviously, long walk into the start of the Labrooks Trophy and they start just as they get to the end of the running rail into the back straight. Now, those caught very wide in the track. Look to have a long way to go to get to the starter, but as they shoot past the starter and we freeze the frame, Cloudy Glen on the far side of the track in the Trevor Hemmings green cap is just about in line with Clot Cap, Fiddler on the roof. Those that are going to go hard in front, whereas Eklat the rear has already lost a length and a half or two. Now, he never again gets on the bridle. And as we play it forward, Charlie Deutsch does lose ground on the run to the first because he hasn't got the speed. Get to the second fence, he's still quite far back. But the fact that he lined up wide and didn't forfeit any ground at the very start, by the time he gets to the bottom of the back straight, he's exactly where he wants to be. So getting a level break is essential over jumps, just like it is on the flat. So was that quite skillful from Charlie? Yeah, I thought it was a great piece of riding because on a horse that was going to lack the speed to hold his position very early, he knew he was going to forfeit ground to the first and to the second, but he didn't forfeit any more by being slow through the tape. Eventually, the novice on the ropes was fourth. He just didn't seem to have the pace to hold his position early on. I was thinking, though, maybe National Hunt Chase, something like that. Yeah, he strikes me more as a horse for extreme distances, uh, National Hunt Chase, maybe even a Grand National, a Welsh National races like that but extreme distances for him yeah he's quite a big price i think compared to with run wild fred for example and his form from there was it the munster national that he won previously yeah, munster national and you know, obviously won right run wild fred even has won a troy town so mm. um yeah no two similar horses now on to what is my favorite section when we talk about it on the show and that is novice chasers now ruby this is a horse that you and I have been excited about from the start of the season. We talked about him when he ran at Carlisle. He's since come out at Newbury. He's been really impressive. It is a hoy senor. Yeah, and he caught a lot of people's attention at, at Newbury, Lydia. Uh, Derek Fox booked him out in front. He was very good at the first fence. Watch his hind end, how far out he kicks his hind legs. And again, at the second, then he gets to the fourth fence, which he was very good. He was awkward at the fifth and at the eighth, which was the water jump little bit like Bob Ollinger. He is a work in progress. He's quite good at the 10th fence. Watch his front legs snapping out. Now, you will notice, again, at the rest of the jumps we show you, everything is slightly to the right, or markedly to the right, some people will say, with, with a high senor. But I love him on the landing side, is that Derek Fox doesn't have to make too much effort to straighten him on landing. So he is going right to give himself a little bit of room, but when he lands, he lands galloping and back in a straight line. It's not a continuous movement to the right. After watching him jumping at Newbury, I went back to the Sefton hurdle and I could see, looking more closely, that he is adjusting slightly to his right over hurdles, but it's more pronounced over fences. It is more pronounced, bigger jump stuff. You need to get a little bit higher, so he needs a little bit more room to get up. But I, I, it's the landing side for me. And it's a hard one to figure out in a debate you could have forever. But I always felt right in Cotto Star that he went left, so therefore he should be a better horse going left-handed, yet he won five King George's. So here we see him jumping the third last in Kempton, out to his right a little bit, and again at the second last. That was just him. But if you watch him at Haydock, at the second last in the Betfair chase, he still goes left. But his record was as good going one way or the other. And the other horse of note or profile right now is at Plutar, who always runs left-handed, 
Yet when you watch him running right-handed at Punchestown, jumps to his right, three out again to his right, and at the last fence that day in Punchestown, he went left. Watch him at the go in the Gold Cup last year, down the hill to the third last, out to his right, and at the last in the back in Haydock, early in the race, to his right again. He does jump right, even though he's a much better record going left. So a preference for going left or right-handed is something that you and I talk about a lot on this series. How do you distinguish you distinguish between the horses that are okay when they're adjusting in a particular direction and those that actually need to go a different way around? Ultimately, it becomes a pattern and results tell you um, that a horse is a better going a certain direction to the other. But to me, it's definitely what they do on the landing side, more so than the takeoff. It's how quickly they straighten up and is their need only to go right to jump or do they actually need to be going that direction? When they land, do they continue to go to the right or left? Or do they land and straighten themselves? To me, a high senior lands and straightens themselves. And presumably it's exacerbated depending on the track, the tightness of the track, and maybe even the sighting of the fences. Yeah, look, a fence that's on an angle, be it to the left or to the right, if you jump the wrong way, you will lose more ground. But again, that depends on how quick you straighten when you land as to how much ground you will lose. So you're thinking of, of where, I mean, Cheltenham, where would you be thinking of? Yeah, Cheltenham, um, maybe Ascot at times. Um, Kempton shouldn't really matter. Um, you know, it, it could be anywhere, Lydia. But then again, a high senior was very straight at the last fence when he was going on. So in a more competitive race, going at speed, he mightn't go as right. So what, Lucinda Russell, who's had some really good horses, one for Arthur, who's won the Grand National, Brindisi Breezer won the Albert Bartlett, she thinks, and I think she's right, that this is her best horse yet. She's talking about going for the um, Quarto Star over the King George course and distance at Kempton. What do you think of that target for him? I think it's a great idea. Uh, jumping to his right will suit him. In he should be going. Um, who knows? Maybe he'll jump left when he goes to Kempton. But um, he, he would suit him. And of course, you have Brave Man's game and what a, an undercard to the King George that'll be. You don't think the track might be sharp-ish for him? No. Good okay. horses win everywhere. OK. Um, looking back at the John Franken that he won at Newbury, previous greats that have won that race, Native River won it in 2015, went on to finish placed in the Quarto Star, second in the National Hunt Chase. Thistlecrack won it in 2016, went on to win the King George as a novice. And Santini won it in 2018, went on to be placed in the uh, uh, Quarto Star and placed in the RSA. And Ahoy Senor won this e even more pre impressively than either of them. Yeah, look, he's a really exciting horse, and I, I I loved him last year in entry when he beat Brave Man's Game, and Oscar Elite was third in that race. He was travelling really well when we saw him falling at Cheltenham last week, so that Sefton form could be about to stack up. Okay, so I promise I haven't been looking over Gary McDaniel's shoulder, but he and I think the same thing. Gary, take it away. Hi, Lydia. I know that some folk have been unhappy at Road to Cheltenham being screened this early in the season. Just to say, though, I'm actually on the 2023 road to Cheltenham already with a boy senor to win the Gold Cup. 33-1 to with Lad Brooks. Yes, he is. So what do you reckon then? 2023 Gold Cup, Ruby? Obviously, that's what you do with your pension money, Lydia. <laughs> best in mad anti-post bets. It really is. It really is. So you would be in the Alfie Potter camp who um, has said something which is, you know, I, I hadn't really considered. Um, lots of water to go under the bridge between now and then. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of water to go under the bridge. I would definitely be more in Alfie's camp. Be realistic. Thank you. Uh, Maddie Playle says, she writes to the Racing Post, why not the 2022 Gold Cup? He reminds me quite a bit of Coney Gree, of course, won the race as a novice, and Connections clearly think the world of him. Go for it, I say. Why, Coney Gree um, didn't exactly have a wonderful career. Yeah, he had a Gold Cup once, so what difference does it make after that? But why would you take on a Plutar, Manila Indo, album photo, and whatever else there is, when you could possibly be the top dog in a novice chase, novices for novice races? Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. As Prince said, let a novice be a novice and a season chaser be a season chaser. Can you sing those lyrics? <laughs> nobody would want anybody, nobody. I can absolutely assure you that nobody wants to hear my singing voice. You know, they, they, and, you know there's, there's glassware around. It wouldn't be a good idea. Shall we move on to the grade one Drinmore, uh, which was won by, won by Beacon Edge with uh, Gabby Nacko, the, I know you're going to like this, the moral victor in second. 
If there's any such thing, Lydia, um, whatever moral victor says, I never got paid for a moral victory anyway. I do know that. Um, but look, they went a really good gallop here, rattled down to the first fence, Gabby Nacco and Lifetime Ambition. And all these novices jumped really well early. First, third, all good. Up to the fifth fence, I know I crab Beacon Edge and Down Royal. But here again, he was a little bit high at this fence. Turn at the sixth or going to the sixth. Look how fast through the air Gabby Nacco is. I'm going to turn down from Ballyhack to the last ditch. Beacon Edge is going as fast as he can. Um, under Dennis O'Regan. The round to the 10th, and this is where it starts for Gabby Nacco. This is his first mistake at the 10th fence. Rolled on to the 11th. Cape Gentleman down the inside in the black and red with all the experience. He tips up. Grand Paradis has to uh, mix or nods on landing. And Beacon Edge still looks like he's going as fast as he can. Three out, midnight run falls. Beacon Edge does have to swerve to avoid him a little bit now. But he looks booked for third, maybe fourth, as they head to two out. Gabby Nacco pecks on landing. And it looks this looks like Fury Road's race to go and win. But they get to the last fence, Gabby Nacco misses, Fury Road finds nothing, and Beacon Edge just outstays them down the outside. And great ride from Dennis O'Regan. I didn't see it coming watching him in Down Royal, but hey, hindsight's a poor man's foresight. Right, quick fire through them. Starting off with Beacon Edge, he looks to me like he needs to go up to three miles sooner rather than later. If you look at his stay as hurdle, um, fourth from last season, however, he loses two places after the last to more thorough stayers. Should we judge his potential stamina capacity on that run? No, I think staying hurdle races can often be more stamina sapping. There's obviously more jumping in a chase than there is a hurdle race, and judging him on his Cheltenham run where you can get racing a long way from home with a lot of galloping and very little jumping. No, I, I, I wouldn't take that. I would be wanting to watch him over fences before I would say he doesn't stay. Okay. Uh, Gavin Ako, can he improve that? Because he got chancier and chancier as the round went on. Of course he will. He's a novice. Um, he has the jump. He has the technique. It's only a matter of getting it all together. Fury Road, does he A, have a problem or B, is he just very polite after you? No, after you. <laughs> I'd say he's an issue um, and it looked like a wind one to me without knowing but also it was worth noting that Beacon Edge did have blood coming from both nostrils when he pulled up Did he? I didn't know that Yeah, he did, he could see it clear as day on television afterwards I didn't realise that, okay um, mm. and final point, um, lifetime ambition for the Grand Annual, yes? If you say so, I wouldn't even be thinking that way well, you know, I've got to think about my pension. Let's move on to the uh, Berkshire Novices chase, shall we? Four runners, two completers. Nassalam managed to win. Yeah, um, you have to get round to win. Simple as that. Pick Dory, flew the fifth last, and I think had all of these horses on the stretch heading for four out under Harry Cobden, but he doesn't back off, hurdles it, and pays the ultimate price. Um, but I think, to me, he was the best horse. Miller's Bank then goes to three out, pricks its ears, has a look, loses a bit of momentum and does the very same thing at the second last where he just basically, with not enough momentum, lands on it and fires Harry, Harry Bannister out over his ears and let left Nasa land to come home alone. Look, Pick Dory, if he's learned from the fall, is the best of these horses, but he has to brush up on his jumping. OK, and uh, Nasa land, they were thinking too far, the ground a bit too quick. And uh, Jamie Moore was of the view that he might have got to Miller's Bank had that horse not unseated his rider. I, 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 I'd agree with him. I thought he was getting to Miller's Bank, but I don't think any of them were going to get to Pick Dory. Yeah, which Jamie also said. Right. Uh, stable companion of Pick Dory, Il Rodota, who won the final race of the Labrooks Winter Carnival at Newbury, a four year old laughing at older season handicappers. Yeah, and earned himself a grade one entry off the back of it. Um, he was travelled really well, he'd no way at all the allowances. He was a slick jumper, very good at three out. Can't really say he jumped two out, but he got from the takeoff side to the landing side um, and was low and quick again at the last. He's only a four-year-old. He's open to loads of improvement um, and he's obviously still a novice. He'll progress, I imagine, and progress himself out of handicaps and end up in novice company. OK, so those are the novice chases. We remain Ahoy Senor fans. So we're coming to the end of this week's show, but Ruby, we cannot leave without looking ahead to the fabulous racing we've got this weekend. Yeah, fabulous race and makes for an easy, an easy show for us next Thursday, Lydia. We will have learned if Shaq and Pursois can climb a hill when he faces Sandowns in the Tingle Creek on Saturday. We'll have the John Durkin, NYLN, Packer du Dare, Alaho, Mellons, Willie Mullins has a whole plethora of horses in there. How many is in there, Ruby? Just the eight, Lydia. Um, some should have gone to Tom Mel, some would have gone to Turles, grounded and allowed that, so they're all backing up. So, look, he could have as many as six in it. And Energamine will have run in the hilly way. And a little bird tells me that you rode Enigamen for the first time this week. I did have that privilege during the week, yeah, and I could see what all the fuss was about. 
Well, that is good to hear. So there'll be loads to talk about this time next week. In the meantime, make sure you catch up with the column that accompanies this series. That's at racingtv.com forward slash Road to Cheltenham. And Ruby and I will see you this time next week. Bye for now. The home of jump racing. This is where the magic happens. Feel like a Cheltenham favourite with Paddy Power.